Okay, uh, last week, just a, just a quick introduction. Um, talked about what we want to cover in the next few weeks. Uh, these are tabernacle hints, as we mentioned. Last week, we went over the overview, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Today, we hope to go over the materials, the colors, uh, numbers, uh, and then uh, subsequent week uh, over the furniture and the, uh, the actual tent construction. And then a second part, shorter part, uh, we want to look at the uh, tabernacle in relation to the scope of Scripture in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. Went over this a little bit last week. Here's a general schematic about the uh, tabernacle. Um, we uh, mentioned that there's three main parts to the tabernacle. Uh, there's the outer court. Uh, as it mentions here, it's 100 cubits by 50 cubits. And we'll be speaking about that a little bit more today. And then there's the tent itself. The whole thing is called the sanctuary. Uh, sometimes the uh, only the back portion is referred to as the sanctuary, but other times the whole of the uh, tabernacle, including the court, uh, is considered the uh, sanctuary. But in the uh, tent, then it's much smaller. You can we can see it's only 10 cubits wide. Cubit, of course, is about a foot and a half, but um, we'll stay with the cubit simply because they have uh, a certain scriptural meaning that uh, our foot, uh, our English uh, measurements would not have. So it's only 10 cubits by 30 cubits divided into two portions. The first is 10 by 20 cubits called the, um, the holy place as we see. And uh, that's a picture as we mentioned of the, uh, of the uh, heavenly places. Uh, and then there's the Holy of Holies behind the veil, a 10 by 10 cube. We mentioned uh, last week that um, there's really, uh, uh, first of all, we wanted to uh, uh, speak about the tabernacle as the habitation of God in the midst of his people. God delights and desires to be in the midst of his people. That's a tremendous privilege, but also, of course, it brings with it responsibility. And then we followed four lines briefly, uh, four lines that we'll be looking at of, uh, of uh, truth that are illustrated in the tabernacle. And that corresponds, uh, the first line we looked at was the universal line. That is that uh, in one sense, God inhabits the universe. It's his habitation. The outer court uh, is a picture of the created universe. And uh, that, in fact, is going to be the uh, uh, oh, one of our inheritances. The Lord Jesus created it, of course, but it's been robbed in a certain sense and corrupted. The Lord is going to redeem it back to himself, and we're going to inherit that with the Lord. That's sometimes called the, uh, the inheritance under our feet. It's a material inheritance. But then the second heavens, if we can speak of it that way, the holy place speaks of the heavenly places that we read about in Ephesians, first introduced actually in the book of Daniel in a general sense, but this is the place of spiritual activity. And uh, this is where our spiritual blessings are in the uh, holy place. And we're going to speak about the uh, furniture when we get there, the uh, particular Christian blessings that we're brought into and then there's the Holy of Holies, the immediate presence of God. Now we know in the heavenly places that, uh, again, it's the, the uh, place of spiritual activity. Satan and his uh, minions have access to that at the present. They're going to be cast out during the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation. But at present, there's spiritual warfare that takes place. Satan is attempting to rob us of the enjoyment of our blessings that we have in heavenly places. But in the Holy of Holies, that's God's immediate presence. Of course, Satan has no access there. That's what Paul called the third heavens. We mentioned that last week. And again, we're going to speak today about the veil, about the door to the holy place, and about the gate, as well as the whole court today. 
So the first line uh, of truth that's illustrated, we mentioned is the universal one. Next, we, uh, let me see if I can skinny this down a little. Next, we uh, looked at this chart somewhat. There's three more lines of truth that are illustrated. The central truth that's illustrated in the tabernacle is the glory of Christ. Now, I don't pretend that this is a comprehensive uh, outline. It's a chart I've been working on for some time. Uh, there's a number of uh, uh, glories that are mentioned. Um, some people have uh, requested uh, they can get copies of my uh, of my slides. I'm going to ask Josh uh, Stewart if I can uh, uh, if I can put those slides in a separate section on his uh, BibleConferenceRecording.com website. I think he'll probably allow that, and then people can go just right to the slides if they want to uh, uh, look at this chart a little bit more and maybe look at some of the references. But one thing we mentioned in particular is that some of the glories of Christ, and of course, the glories of Christ are really the displayed glories of the Godhead, for in him all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell, we read in the first chapter of Colossians. Some of those glories are intrinsic, that is, they were his from all eternity. Some are acquired, for instance, creation, and the fact that he took manhood into his person. Uh, heirship, uh, I say intrinsic and acquired because, again, it's been robbed in a certain sense, but the Lord is going to redeem the earthly inheritance. We also have a spiritual inheritance. That's what we have in the holy place, holy places right now. That's our spiritual inheritance that Peter speaks about, for instance. His moral glory was acquired. His redemption glories are acquired. And... Uh, uh, so on. His headship glories, mostly acquired. Principalities and powers, that's the angels and so on. Uh, some of that's intrinsic. Some perhaps uh, acquired uh, because he passed by angels twice, as we've often heard. Uh, he's a shepherd. Uh, he was a shepherd in the Old Testament, but that's also an acquired glory, high priest, advocate, his kingdom glory, again, he is king by right, intrinsic right, but also uh, he has to uh, redeem that inheritance as well. Now, this was one of the most challenging parts for me, this uh, section on shared or not shared, because um, what we have illustrated in the tabernacle, again, are the glories of God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ tremendous truth. This, these aren't just uh, 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 ancient museum pieces, but it speaks of some of the deepest truths that we have in the universe. And I might mention, I think this is the tabernacle is one of the most comprehensive uh, figures of the Lord's glories that we have uh, illustrated in the Old Testament. If we look to uh, a comprehensive overview of the Lord's life, we can look at Joseph, he gives us a comprehensive overview of the Lord's life. If we want a comprehensive view of God's dispensational dealings, we can go to Leviticus 23 and look at the uh, seven feasts of Jehovah. If we want a comprehensive view of the work as well as the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, we get it as we've had in previous weeks with our brother Bill in the offerings. But as far as a comprehensive view of the glories of Christ and how they're shared with mankind, I think we get that in the tabernacle. So we mentioned last week, these aren't just beautiful things. We don't go to a museum just to look at it. Some people do that. But uh, we mentioned uh, something I noticed uh, for those who weren't here last week, something I noticed as a young man when I was first going to college and uh, had to read some of the old uh, Greek classics and how much the Greeks admired beauty. But I, I thought, well, surely I'd find a doctrine about beauty in the New Testament. We do have it in the Old Testament a number of times. You can look at a concordance. But in the New Testament, there was no doctrine of beauty. The word is mentioned, I think, four times, but never in a doctrinal standpoint. So I wondered, 
what what happened here? Well, I started reading in the book of Peter. Seven times in first and second Peter, we have the word precious because I believe that precious is intimacy with beauty. So we're not only looking at the glories from a uh, intellectual standpoint, but we're looking at it from uh, in many respects. Uh, first of all, for who they are in our Lord Jesus Christ is illustrating and displaying what God himself is, but then also the fact that many of these are shared. And I, I again, I had trouble with this because uh, the Lord Jesus is preeminent in all these things, but in so many of these things we share. Uh, for instance, in new creation, do I say not shared or shared? Well, he's the head of new creation, that's true, and that's not shared. But we are participants in the new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And so, again, I, I, I'm not real satisfied with uh, this, but as far as his headship goes, he's unique. But certainly we share uh, in that of which he is the head. <clears throat> okay, this week, what I wanted to talk about was the tabernacle, its uh, materials, colors, and numbers especially. This has sometimes been called the tabernacle's alphabet. This is what we have in the first uh, nine verses, particularly in uh, Exodus 25, the free will offerings of the children of Israel for the construction of the tabernacle. All right, let's look first at the metals. Pure gold speaks of deity. That's not shared, as we well know, but we'll be talking about gold. And then there's gold uh, without the pure part. It speaks of the divine righteousness for drawing near to God and uh, acceptance in God's presence, God's holy presence. There's silver. We'll, we'll look at uh, some uh, silver is mentioned a number of times in the tabernacle. Those are the blessings of atonement, the Lord's perfect work. And brass, that's the other third main type of, uh, of uh, metal. It's really copper, we're told. Um, it's called brass. We talk about the brazen altar, and we will use the common terms that are used. But nonetheless, we understand that it really is copper speaks of divine righteousness and respect of sin. It's the price of atonement. So silver are the blessings of atonement. Brass is the price of atonement. Let's look at some colors. Blue is the heavenly character, the color of the sky, and heavenly grace. The Lord Jesus displays that heavenly character and heavenly grace. And also, in a certain sense, it can be looked at as the church, because the church is a heavenly people. Purple is a color we see quite often in the tabernacle as well. Uh, that was the color of the Roman emperors. It uh, speaks of universal royalty, uh, in a certain sense of the Gentiles, but in another sense of his universal uh, glories. Uh, as uh, reigning over both heaven and earth in the future day. And the other main color we see a number of times is scarlet. Earthly royalty uh, in connection with Israel in particular. Uh, don't have time to go into the documentation of this, but there are many, uh, many resources. Many things have been written on the uh, tabernacle. Um, you can get uh, many on uh, on some of the web uh, websites uh, such as biblecenter.org or uh, stem publishing or bible truth publishers many many things that have been written as well as the internet generally on the tabernacle but those are the three main colors that we'll run into we will talk about red a little bit later although red was something that was a dye it was not provided in the uh, and the first nine verses of Exodus 25. Okay, some other materials. Part of the 
tabernacle alphabet is shittim wood, uh, or sometimes called uh, acacia wood, the only wood that we find in the tabernacle. Uh, that was the wood of the desert, often referred to as a incorruptible wood. And so it's a picture of incorruptible human nature. And the Lord Jesus, of course, uh, he was holy and without spot. Uh, and, and men, we have a new nature that's incorruptible, uh, as we're told in the first epistle of John. There are curtains, too, that are used. We have fine twined linen is often mentioned, speaks of spotless purity. It was white and uh, also a practical righteousness. Goat's hair is one of the uh, uh, curtains uh, at, that make up the uh, tent part of the tabernacle particularly. And we know that the prophets used to wear garments of goat's hair. And so it speaks particularly of the Lord's prophetic character. And of course, uh, in an application to believers, we have a prophetic character as well. There are some coverings over the tent as well. There were two inner curtains and then there were some coverings. There's ram skins dyed red is one of the uh, coverings. It speaks of the Lord's absolute consecration, even unto death. There's the red part. Red and scarlet are look a little different. We have scarlet mentioned a number of times. Again, I believe that's earthly glory, earthly royalty. The Lord Jesus is the Messiah and uh, he will reign uh, over Israel and over all the earth. But when it's ram skin, the rams, we'll talk, talk about that a little bit in a subsequent talk here, but it speaks of the Lord's absolute consecration, even to death. And then the badger skin was the outer covering of the tent itself, speaks of the zealous holiness for God's honor. There were precious stones, a number of precious stones. There's some question about exactly what these precious stones were. We won't go into details again. Uh, you can look those up, uh, what some commentators understand. They do vary somewhat, but certainly there's no question that as far as the precious stones represent the Lord's glory, they speak of his variegated excellence. There was 12 precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest and he had two onyx stones on his shoulders we're not sure what onyx is exactly it's not the onyx that we know but it was a brilliant gem we're told in the book of job and it certainly speaks of the lord's glory but on those stones were written the different names of the 12 tribes of israel so it also speaks of redemption's treasures uh, we might mention very briefly that there's three times in scripture that we have a description of precious stones the first time is in ezekiel 28 uh, when it speaks of the anointed cherub which we know later after his fall was satan he was the highest of god's created creatures and all the beauties of creation were displayed in him in the garden of eden as such it speaks of and then second that's God's glory in creation. Secondly, we have God's glory in redemption. That's what we have particularly in the tabernacle. And again, uh, this is what uh, Aaron wore on his breastplate, were 12 precious stones, different, each one different, each one with the name of one of the tribes of Israel inscribed uh, on them. And then finally, we get in Revelation we get the glory, uh, the, uh, the beauty of glory, when we have all the different stones that are part of the, uh, of the uh, heavenly Jerusalem during the millennium. So there we have the glory of God in creation, the glory of God in redemption, and then finally God's earthly glory during the, the uh, millennial period. Okay, oil is also something that uh, was part of this alphabet, uh, was part of the free will offerings of the Israelites. Speaks, of course, of the Holy Spirit. 
um, and also the uh, oil was used for anointing. The oil was used in the lampstands, the seven uh, uh, seven uh, armed lampstand that's in the heavenly places. But also it speaks of the Holy Spirit and it was used for anointing of the whole tabernacle as well as for the uh, anointing of the priests. So the Holy Spirit speaks of the anointing uh, in anointing we have in the New Testament, it teaches us that his anointing gives us spiritual discernment or spiritual intelligence. Also, we have his sealing. We have his sealing gives us uh, power. And then we have the earnest of the Spirit of God. That teaches us what's to come. Earnest of those glories that are going to come in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, those things we look forward to. So the Holy Spirit gives us all three of those things, the anointing, the sealing, and the earnest. There were spices for the anointing, and that's a picture of the fruit of the Spirit. There were sweet spices and incense. There was incense that was offered on the... Uh, uh, the golden altar, which is in the holy place, as we'll see, uh, that's the perfection. Uh, it speaks of perfection in intercession and in worship. And then something that uh, wasn't really an offering of the children of Israel, but we have the cherubim inscribed on the veil and also cherubim in the inner uh, uh, curtain of the tabernacle itself. The cherubim are the executors of God's righteous judgment. They're also the intelligent observers of the manifold wisdom of God, as we have mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3. So, um, beautiful truth there. Uh, they're not only the executors of God's righteous judgment to make sure everything is done perfectly, according to God's will, but also they're the observers, the intelligent observers of the manifold wisdom of God, not in themselves, but in mankind. Okay, there's a number of numbers that we have, and I don't get hung up on a lot of detail here, but there are several numbers in connection with the tabernacle that seem to have a general meaning. Three, of course is abundant testimony. Two is sufficient testimony. Three is abundant testimony. And we're going to see there was the three sections of the tabernacle, for instance, speaking of the three uh, heavens uh, we spoke about before in the universal aspect. Four is often mentioned in the tabernacle as well. That speaks of, that's the universal number. It goes out to the four winds of the world. Uh, and we'll see how that has an application as well. Five speaks of human weakness. Seven speaks of spiritual completeness. We're going to see seven, for instance. Uh, we mentioned the seven arms of the, of the lampstand, or sometimes called the candlestick, although really it's a lampstand. Also, there were seven... Um, uh, well, seven lampstands, uh, so that's a number of spiritual completeness. And ten is uh, human responsibility. For instance, we have ten fingers, ten toes. There was ten commandments. Human responsibility that has to be met one way or the other. And then twelve, administrative completeness. We see that especially in the 12 loaves of showbread on the uh, table of showbread speaks of administrative completeness, uh, of course, during the earth and also uh, uh, at the present time. Uh, there's a certain sense in which there's the apostles fellowship. Um, bread often speaks of fellowship among believers. Okay, wanted to stop there for a minute. Uh, if anybody wants to interject some things, this is kind of halfway through. 
uh, be happy to, uh, this is the alphabet if it's often called. Now we're going to go on to the alphabet configured and see how these different parts come together to, uh, uh, to uh, form uh, words we would say in our language or else uh, 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 complete thoughts of the Lord's glory and our blessing. So I'll hesitate here a minute if we somebody wants to interject or add a comment or perhaps a question. One thing okay. I would would just say is that, that uh, the Psalm 29 says, The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest, and in his temple doth every whit speak glory. So that the tabernacle was really an expression of the Lord Jesus, wasn't it? And his glory. And that's what you're seeking to bring out, I believe. Yeah, that's the primary teaching without a doubt. And then there's the universal and then there's the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the line of, of the uh, Christian and also of Israel isn't there. And obviously, though, the, you're exactly right, the central theme is the glory of Christ. But our dignity and our blessings are based on his glory. Uh, and that's true of Israel as well, isn't it? They're all derived from his glory. And that's why we can, uh, some of these things are shared, as we mentioned. And that's uh, not, uh, not anything that should be strange because... Uh, we certainly have enjoyed that God has come out of his essential fullness, as Mr. Darby mentioned. Uh, God was complete in himself. I don't believe that it was necessary for God to, uh, to come out of his essential completeness. Uh, some have suggested that, but I've never been quite comfortable with that. But um, God chose to uh, come out in his glory. And uh, we noticed last week that God desires to dwell among his people. The Lord Jesus uh, uh, speaks of his delight being with the sons of men and even in a past eternity. And uh, so he he's desires to be among his people. Love, a characteristic of love, of course, is that it wants to be in the company of the object of its love. And so God is love. And he desires to dwell in the midst of his people. And so many of these glories are shared, or we come into the blessing of these glories. So what a wonderful subject we have before us. Well, we want to start bringing this together now. The sanctuary is the display of God's glory and also of man's blessing, because love also seeks the blessing and the happiness of the object of its love. And so we know, again, the sanctuary, uh, that word, of course, is very similar to holiness. Uh, the sanctuary, again, is used for the whole tabernacle on a few occasions, and sometimes confined to just the tent of the tabernacle, the holy place and the holy of holies. But the sanctuary, it's the display of God's glory and the display of man's blessing as a consequence. So it's the alphabet configured now. We're going to look at the uh, some of the pieces of the tabernacle, particularly the courtyard, uh, the gate, the uh, door, as it's called, the door, the entrance, as uh, King James calls it, the entrance to the holy place, and then the veil itself. I want to cover those things uh, in the next few minutes, Lord willing. Okay, here's uh, what happened to our. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward, there shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits long for one side. And the pillars thereof shall be twenty, and their sockets twenty, of copper. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for the north side in length, there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, and the pillars thereof twenty, and their sockets twenty of copper, 
the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the other side shall be hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be a screen of twenty cubits, of blue and purple and scarlet, and fine twined linen, the work of the weaver in colors, their pillars four, and their sockets four. All the pillars of the court round about shall be filleted with silver, their hooks of silver, and their sockets of copper. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and their sockets of copper. All the instruments of the tabernacle, and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court shall be of copper. Exodus chapter 27 verses 9 through 19. Okay, so that's a little video clip we showed uh, last week, but uh, that shows the, uh, the general outline of the tabernacle court and also the door that we're going to speak of, the entrance into the tent of the tabernacle itself. So let's look first at the tabernacle court. Some of the things that make up the tabernacle court. We have the uh, hangings of fine twined linen. And as we mentioned before, that speaks of spotless purity. I believe what we have in the tabernacle, uh, some call it the tabernacle fence, the outer uh, uh, delineation of the court, is the blessings of the gospel. And in the gospel, we recognize that God is not only love, but God is light. And there's spotless purity uh, promised to us as one of the blessings of the gospel. I think this is uh, so important. We hear a lot of uh, 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 seeker churches and that kind of thing, where there's an effort made to try to uh, accommodate the gospel to uh, the natural man. That's not the gospel that we have in scripture. The gospel we have in scripture is one of spotless purity, as well as love. God is light as well as love. We read that in the first chapter of 1 John. Uh, in him is light, and there is no darkness at all. And that's a wonderful thing, really, because if there were darkness in God, then uh, there would be anarchy. But God is holy, and as a result, there's absolute blessing uh, as a result of the gospel. So I believe in the tabernacle court, uh, outside of the gate itself, which we'll look at next, we have that promise of spotless purity. The sockets and pins are of copper. We spoke about that before. Again, I told you we'd go over these things again. We're putting the alphabet together into words, so to speak. That speaks, of course, of the price of atonement. In the gospel, there is the price of atonement. So the pins that held up the uh, pillars and the sockets themselves uh, on which the pillars were, uh, were, were, were standing are copper. The price of atonement, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the cross of Calvary. The chapiters, that's the cap of the uh, pillars, uh, the hooks. And the fillets, the fillets were really the connecting rods between the various pillars. They were all of silver. And that speaks again, as we mentioned, of the blessings of atonement. There are tremendous blessings that come out of atonement, as we have spoken before. 
Now the numbers here a little bit, the court hangings, it's 100 by 50, 100 cubits by 50, and it's five cubits high. Five speaks again of man's weakness. We don't like to uh, naturally speak of our weakness. It's been mentioned that every religion of the world is based on law keeping, that men can somehow incur God's blessing or uh, uh, somehow uh, bring about their own salvation. But the truth is that the only way we can enter into the blessings of the gospel story is by recognizing that we're lost and guilty and ruined. And so that's what five speaks of. There were a number of pillars as well. Uh, and they were divided five cubits apart. So the number five is common in the court, and it speaks of man's weakness. That's the basis of inter man's introduction into God's, uh, into God's uh, blessing. But 10, uh, 50, and 100, of course, are multiples of 10. Again, that speaks of man's responsibility being met. And the gospel story certainly does meet man's responsibility, even though man is uh, very weak. The pillars, again, there was 20 pillars along the uh, uh, along the uh, north, uh, along the uh, north and the east, uh, north and the west, and 10 pillars uh, on the uh, on the uh, north, uh, the the west side and five cubits between them. So again, we have those multiples of five and 10. Uh, 20 is a multiple of five and four. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. So I think the tabernacle court again speaks of the blessings of the gospel. Wisdom crieth without. Uh, it's a promise of blessing and all things are ready, come. There's a great feast that's been prepared for mankind, and that's the promise of the, the uh, blessings of the gospel. What a wonderful truth that we have there. Next is the court gate. We saw that in the little video clip, uh, the beautiful gate. There's four pillars that hold up the gate, and four again is the universal number whosoever will may come. I believe if the, um, if the uh, court hangings themselves speak of the blessings of the gospel, I think what we have, especially in the uh, gate, is the blesser himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. So four pillars, the Lord Jesus calls to whosoever will may come. 20 cubits wide, that's four by five again. It's a universal invitation, but also we have to recognize our weakness of mankind. Only Christianity teaches us that, uh, uh, that uh, we come to him in our lost and guilty condition, and he, that's the introduction into blessing. I think of that uh, verse in Luke chapter 20. Verse 18, whosoever shall fall on that stone shall be broken. That's man's weakness. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's man's responsibility outside of the work of Christ. Christ has met man's responsibility. But man by himself attempting to keep the law, which again is the basis of every religion of mankind outside of Christianity, it's going to end in disaster. He'll be grind him to powder in the day of judgment. So there we have four by five universal invitation, but also man's weakness. Fine twined linen with colors of blue, purple, and scarlet. We've spoken about that. The uh, glorious person of our Lord Jesus Christ in his purity and his heavenly his uh, universal and his uh, uh, earthly glories. Romans 9 through 11, 
we have uh, an interesting dispensational outline. In Romans chapter 9, we have God's sovereignty in blessing to the first man, all the privileges that were afforded to Israel. And yet in Romans chapter 10, we see what happens in every case when uh, God's blessing is entrusted to mankind, the first man. There's always failure in responsibility. And so Israel, as the sample of mankind, forfeited the blessings based on the first man. But then in the chapter 11, we have God's irresistible purpose of blessing. God's purposes will never, never be frustrated. And so in the 11th chapter, we have the blessing, not only for Israel, but also, as we know, in the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, the blessing of the church period. And that ends, those three chapters end with this uh, doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's the uh, summary the apostle gives of the, of the uh, wisdom of God uh, in, his, uh, in his gospel blessings. Here's a little chart I put together. <clears throat> Speaking about this gate especially, not going to go into every detail, but we have, of course, in the four gospels, it's really a four-sided gospel. And uh, I thought of this, of course, as a chart I put together before, but in the tabernacle colors, we have those four colors we spoke of. Uh, we know that uh, Matthew speaks of, particularly was written to the uh, Jews. That was the audience for Matthew. And uh, it speaks particularly of the Lord's glory. More Old Testament scriptures are quoted in Matthew than any of the other uh, three Gospels. Mark, we know the Lord Jesus is looked at as a servant and as a prophet. And uh, the audience was the Romans. Um, and I think uh, we know the color of the emperors was purple because they claimed universal uh, sovereignty. And so we see that purple as well on the gate. And then Luke speaks of the Lord's humanity as the Son of Man. And uh, there's some key words. Don't have time to go into detail there, but his genealogy, of course, goes all the way back uh, through Adam and to God himself. And the audience was the Greek. Uh, as far as the sacrifices go, uh, many of us have heard our brother Norman Berry used to remind us that uh, the uh, four Gospels uh, are represented in the uh, four major sacrifices that we have in the early chapters of Leviticus. And he would remind us, too, that uh, the meat offering, which is not mentioned here, of course, speaks about the Lord's perfection in his life, and that was present in all four of the Gospels. But the, the uh, Matthew particularly speaks of the trespass offering, because the Jews were guilty, they knew better. Mark, perhaps, the uh, sin offering, because they were sinners, but often they didn't, know, uh, they didn't know what they did wrong. So they were sinners, they were guilty, they were lost, but not as responsible of, as Israel, which had the uh, particular uh, blessings of God, as we have in uh, Romans chapter 9. Luke was the peace or the fellowship offering. Uh, it was God seeking fellowship with his creature. And then John, the burnt offering, where the Lord Jesus was offered up holy to God. And that's the blue color. The Lord Jesus was the heavenly stranger in this world. He's the son of God, uh, as we well know. And there's uh, four faces. It's often been suggested. Again, I realize not everybody sees all these things or agrees with all these things, but these are fairly common uh, in the commentators, and I've appreciated them as well. So the lion, lion of the tribe of Judah for Matthew, the ox again going along with the purple, 
the great servant, uh, the ox being a, 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 a plodding servant for mankind. And in Luke, the face of a man, as we see in these uh, places in Ezekiel and Revelation, and then the heavenly side, the heavenly power of the eagle. Uh, and then there's some beholds you can look up and the Old Testament branches. Again, I'll talk to uh, communicate with Josh Stewart, see if he can put these on uh, on uh, 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 the, the slides separate on his website. Okay, we spoke about the three parts again. We saw in that little video clip, we saw the gate. We just spoke about the gate the blesser the gospel blesser the lord jesus himself especially those beautiful colors uh by themselves would speak of something that's wonderful inside the tabernacle enclosure itself and so the gospel message is a message not only of blessing but of the blesser and the glories uh, that would enter in but we know that it takes new life to appreciate these things and then we're going to talk next now about the door, called the door in the King James, the entrance, 10 cubits wide, 10 cubits high, uh, and the, the uh, holy place is 20 cubits uh, deep. And uh, that's what I want to go into next. And then finally, again, the veil. We'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Okay, the tent door. The hanging is blue. Here again, we're putting the alphabet together. Um, it's interesting. Uh, maybe if we go back just a sec. Um, only the priests could enter into the holy place. The common people could come into the gate if they were clean. And they could uh, offer up, uh, present their offering. But only the priests then... Uh, had to wash their hands and their feet at the labor. We'll get into this in more detail uh, in future weeks. And they had to be clean, and only the priests could enter in through the door of the uh, holy place. And there they did much of their ministering inside the holy place. Okay, so that tent door, what does that speak of? Well, the hanging is blue, heavenly, purple, uh, again, speaking of the person of Christ in his universal aspect and scarlet having to do with his, uh, uh, his earthly royalty, fine twine linen, no compromise of holiness, five pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. I couldn't find, uh, maybe somebody can find it. I don't know exactly what the pillars of the court were made out of. It's generally assumed that they were shittim wood, but I couldn't find that uh, as I looked in scripture. But it is specifically mentioned that the uh, pillars of the door and also of the of the uh, veil, as well as the boards of the tent itself, were made out of shittim wood. So it's generally understood that the uh, the uh, uh, courtyard pillars were made out of shittim wood, but we're not told that. But here we have five pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Again, gold speaks of divine righteousness. We can't enter into the holy place, the uh, heavenly place of heavenly blessings of spiritual activity, apart from recognizing our dependence on the Lord himself. Shittim wood again speaks of, of uh, spotless, hum of our humanity, holy humanity, there are five sockets of copper, as we mentioned. The uh, copper, again, speaks of the, uh, the price of atonement. The chapiters, the, the uh, top and the fillets, um, that is the connecting rods uh, that hold the uh, five pillars together and the hooks on which the uh, curtain was attached were all overlaid with gold. So we're seeing a, a rise in the type of uh, metals that are used going from the gate to uh, the door. Uh, it's a higher standard of responsibility and privilege. What does that speak of? Well, 
it speaks of the entrance into our proper Christian blessings, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in Christ, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Now, much of Christianity uh, has to do with the gospel. That's what we get, get at the great uh, brazen altar. We'll speak about that. Uh, then much of Christianity has to do with that labor. We'll get into that more detail in subsequent weeks, which speaks of practical sanctification. Uh, we are holy, uh, but we have to be holy as well in our practical lives in order to get the blessings of Christianity. But in order to enter into the, the uh, tent itself, something else is required. And I believe that's consecration. Only the priests that were consecrated and only the priests that were clean could enter into the door of the tent itself. I beseech you, therefore, we just read a few minutes ago about uh, the last verses of Romans chapter 11. And as a result of the uh, blessings of Christianity, the apostle beseeches us, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or intelligible service. As Christians, many people stop short. Many Christians are satisfied to uh, have, a, uh, 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 have an escape from hell. Perhaps we can say that's the minimum of what the brazen altar speaks of. Many Christians are satisfied to uh, live a clean life, to have uh, look at Christianity as a way to have a happy, to be a good husband and a good wife and have a happy family. Those are all mercies and blessings of Christianity to a certain extent. But the proper blessings of Christianity lie inside the holy place. That's where every spiritual blessing is in the heavenlies in Christ. But it requires consecration to enter into that, uh, into that door and to see the three pieces of furniture there, the, uh, the uh, candlestick or the lampstand, the table of showbread, the uh, altar, uh, which speak of Christ and also speak of our Christian blessings. And we also get administration in the table of showbread uh, on the earth. But the requirement to enter into those spiritual blessings is to have our hands filled with Christ. That's what consecration literally means. The priest had to be consecrated as well as clean uh, in a practical way to enter into the blessings of the heavenly place. And again, we'll speak about that as we get into uh, subsequent weeks. What about the veil? Well, the veil was the third segment, the immediate entrance into God's presence itself. It was a hanging of blue again, purple and scarlet, speaking of the Lord's glories in various ways, as we've been mentioning, fine twine linen. Now it also had cherubims. Uh, the cherubims were guarding the entrance into God's immediate presence, just like the cherubims uh, guarded the entrance into the Garden of Edom when our first parents sinned. And uh, there's four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Gold, again, it's the requirement of divine righteousness. It must be the... Uh, uh, righteousness that God uh, gives to mankind based on the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ and our participation in it. But it's interesting that there's shittim wood there and there's four pillars. In my mind, that means that God desi desires that we would enter in to his immediate presence. So humanity and the universal aspect of the four pillars but that way was closed in Israel. We know that only the high priest could enter in once a year on the great day of atonement and that not without blood or he would be struck dead. 
But the with Christianity, of course, we know that the veil was rent. And so I think it's the promise that God desires and delights that men would enter into his very presence. Four sockets of silver, of course, the blessings of atonement, as we mentioned there, the sockets of the pillars were silver, great blocks of silver. Wade, uh, some have suggested that the great blocks of silver and the great blocks of uh, of, uh, of copper weighed probably over 100 pounds a piece. That's how the pillars were held up and the boards, as we're going to see later on in the tent itself. So four sockets of silver. There's no entrance into that place apart from the finished work of Christ. The fillets and hooks are overlaid with gold again that divine righteousness that's required it could be nothing less holiness without which no man shall see the lord we cannot enter into his presence apart from absolute holiness which comes from god himself the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom we know this is the secret of christianity in the old testament again uh, there was the contrast with Christianity. The Jews could not enter in, and speaking reverently, God could not come out in the blessing that he desired for mankind. He was hid uh, uh, in that, uh, in that holy, holiest place. Uh, the Shekinah glory sat above the, uh, uh, the mercy seat between the two cherubims where the blood once a year was placed. The blood came from the offerings uh, on the great day of atonement that was offered up on the brazen altar. The work of Christ satisfies the holy requirements of God. But in Christianity, we know at the cross, the way is now open. That universal aspect is now made plain. <clears throat> Excuse me. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. From the top to the bottom, that means that God did it, not man. Man would have done it from the bottom to the top. We're told that that veil, that we know this is the temple, but it's the same same thought. The veil, we're told, was a was a uh, was a hand breadth thick, tremendous veil, and yet it was rent in twain when the Lord Jesus gave up the ghost and said, "It is finished." Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, that's the very presence of God, by the blood of Jesus through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, let us draw near. There we have the four pillars. God the, desires that we would be come into his very presence, not only in the future day, which is true, but that's a present truth. That's where we worship. And so in a certain sense for the believer now, the, uh, the tabernacle, ten of tabernacle, is one. Uh, the veil is rent. The way into the holiness is made plain, uh, made open now. God is free, speaking reverently, to come out. And man, under the proper circumstances, is free to enter in and to worship there in the very presence of God himself. Here's a schematic somebody's idea of what the tabernacle may have looked like there's the cherry bims there's the different colors here was the uh, three pieces of furniture in the holy place outside of the veil the uh, uh, the uh, uh, altar of incense no blood was offered here it was only incense was offered up it's worship and intercession the table of showbread uh we'll speak about that the fellowship the uh seven armed candlestick or lampstand just a little nugget here i've often enjoyed from a christian perspective that what we have here in these three pieces of furniture i know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves but i believe it's what we have in acts 242 the apostle they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine I believe we'll see that in the candlestick. It's made out of pure gold. And the apostles' fellowship, 
there we have the table of showbread with the bread that we're to have fellowship with one with another and in breaking of bread worship and in prayer intercession offered up on the uh, altar of showbread uh, the altar of uh, incense finally i just want to mention just in closing here we have the lord jesus three times it mentions in the old testament his ear was digged first of all an incarnation in psalm 40 6 through 8 we just read how the veil is his flesh it's the very flesh of our lord jesus christ we're told that in hebrews mine ears hast thou opened lo i come i delight to do thy will psalm 40 verses 6 through 8 that speaks of the incarnation the lord jesus taking manhood into his person the veil of the temple of the tabernacle and of the temple and then secondly we have his perfection in service the lord god hath opened mine ear and i was not rebellious neither turned away back isaiah 50 verse 5 that's one of the servant songs there the four servant songs in the book of isaiah the lord jesus as the perfect servant the perfect man and then finally as we well know in exodus 21 if that servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free his master shall bore his ear through with an all that's atonement the lord jesus offering himself up at calvary's cross okay i think we're over a little bit Hopefully, uh, everybody's awake. I wonder, Eric, if you could just do a quick review. It, it really uh, spoke to me um, about the path for us into the holy place, uh, particularly to the altar of incense. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't just available, was it? Just to, to, you know, in picture for us to just go in and, and offer uh, what we're enjoying of Christ, God. Uh, there's a process uh, for that incest to be truly acceptable. Well, Doug, why don't you uh, give us a little outline? I'd like to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, I'm asking. <laughs> Maybe another brother has a, has a thought. I mean, the, the, the gate and the, the labor and the, the door Well, it certainly is progressive, isn't it? They're progressive blessings as we enter into the very presence of God. And that's where our worship is, is it not? Because the veil is rent and it's in the immediate presence of God. But again, it does require, of course, not only salvation. It requires practical sanctification as we have in the labor. Again, we'll get into that more in the future. But then it requires really, truly consecration to enter into the fullness of the ble christian blessings the lord has for us uh, only the priests could do that they had to be consecrated they had to be clean to enter into that place and worship but i'd like to hear what others have thoughts have on that yeah and and just uh i know you meant it but just may in case someone doesn't know Entering the gate is a picture of salvation, isn't it? Absolutely. Salvation doesn't necessarily bring us up to the altar of incense. You know, we of course praise and and uh, and we're rejoicing in our salvation, but it's just the first step, isn't it, into into true praise and worship? 
Yeah, I mentioned uh, last week, there's kind of three, three uh, steps I'm going to follow. Maybe that's what you're referring to, Josh, but uh, uh, Doug. But uh, the first is salvation, isn't it? There's no blessing apart from salvation. Either we fall on that stone and are broken, or we're going to be crushed to pieces by that very stone and judgment. And so that's salvation. But sadly, many Christians, uh, Mr. Uh, Walston points this out in his little book on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, Egypt to Canaan. Uh, he says there's really three classes of Christians, sad to say. I may be saved, but I still may, maybe I just want a fire escape from hell. And I may be a worldly Christian. I remember my mother-in-law used to often say that, uh, you know, a worldly Christian is a Christian that uh, if he were hauled before the court for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict him. Well, we don't want to be worldly Christians, do we? But sad to say, our old nature says, oh, just be a worldly Christian. Just have a fire escape from hell. That's uh, going through the gate, isn't it? But then uh, there's the waiver. And again, we're going to get into this in more detail. But uh, in the Reformation, the, the uh, truth of salvation was recovered. And we can be so thankful for, for, for that. The authority of the word of God, the fact that it wasn't the church that saves, that's what the Catholics taught, but it's Christ that saves. And that's, again, the salvation, isn't it? But then we have practical sanctification. That's the labor. And in the Reformation, they appreciated that. Um, Martin Luther went on a uh, journey representing his, um, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, group of priests to Rome. And as he saw Rome in the distance, he, uh, uh, he fell on his knees. And he thought it must be a wonderful holy city. When he got there, he found it was full of filthiness and immorality. And one of the things then of the, one of the great tenets of the Reformation then, is not only salvation, but also practical sanctification. If we say we're Christians, we should act like a Christian. But that's only the second stage, isn't it? I may be, may be thankful that uh, uh, as a Christian, I can have a stable family. Perhaps I can be a, a good employee. Uh, I can be a good husband or a good wife. Those are all wonderful things, and they are blessings of Christianity. But they're not really the proper blessings of Christianity. They're, those are reserved in the heavenly places. And uh, it takes consecration to enter into that. Mr. Walston says that a person may be clean, so far as the uh, uh, as far as the uh, practical sanctification goes, but uh, he may be an earthly-minded Christian. Uh, he wants to have that stable home and so on and so forth, but he hasn't really entered into the proper blessings of Christianity, which are reserved uh, in the holy place, in the uh, holy place, and only reserved for those who enter in through consecration as well as practical sanctification. And there inside the holy place, as I mentioned, uh, I enjoy just very briefly uh, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the candlestick, the uh, apostles' fellowship, the table of showbread with its bread, and, and breaking of bread, worship, and prayer, intercession into God's very, uh, very presence, as we know, because the veil has been rent. Is that what you had in mind, Doug? Very nice. Yes. I call that, I think I called that last week, the first stage is uh, salvation. The second is sanctification, especially practical sanctification. And the third then I called satisfaction because it's the entrance into our proper Christian blessings and the blesser himself, God himself, that really brings a profound satisfaction to our hearts and our minds. Is that not true? Very nice. Thank you. Oh, I have a question. So, 
Ken? Yeah, I was wondering if we get a little picture of the progress of the Christian in Lazarus. Um, we find the Lord calling him forth out of the grave. And uh, then he says uh, to his disciples, uh, loose him and let him go. And then a little later, we find him sitting at the table with the Lord and uh, his family. Is that a little picture of progress? I was, I was just wondering. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's many pictures of that in scripture, aren't there? Uh, I remember uh, I had a professor when I was in graduate school and he said, uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. <laughs> and that's really what we have in scripture, don't we? We have the same themes over and over, and yet yeah. they're turned in such a beautiful way that we, unless we think about it, we don't know they're the same themes because they're presented in a different way. But you're absolutely right, that and there's many others as well. We get the same thing in the journey from Egypt to Canaan, don't we? Right. And uh, that's really the outline, we'll get to that later, Lord willing, but that's really the outline we have in both the Old and the New Testament, but you're exactly right. It's certainly a picture of, of, uh, of our progress. And we could even mention in 1 John, couldn't we? Uh, babes, young men, and fathers. The babes right. are those that are saved. Yeah. The young men are those that are not only saved, but practically sanctified. And I believe the young men are those that are consecrated. But the fathers are those that have gone uh, on for many years in the holy place mm -hmm. and have an appreciation of God himself. Beautiful picture. I think Mark Mortensen had something to say there. I cut him off. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, I had a question now. If, if I'm understanding you correct, Eric, you're saying that we enter into the holy place uh, upon receiving the gospel? Is that, is that correct? Uh, no, I don't think I said that. I think the gospel is the first stage, right? And in a certain sense, that's when we get all our rights, right? But we don't practically enter into it unless we're clean and and, uh, and consecrated. But you're, it's correct that it is, it is our portion once we're saved, but we don't enter into the appreciation of it unless we're clean and unless we take advantage of consecration. Yes, what I'm wondering is, do we enter, do we, are we saved when we enter the outer court? Oh, I believe so. The, uh, the brazen altar is really salvation, isn't it? Now, sanctification, Mark, you asked about that last week, and again, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but the man that stands outside of the, uh, of the gate, uh, I believe the reason he sees the beauty of the gate and has a desire to enter in is what we might call sanctification of the spirit. It's the spirit that opens my eyes and quickens me to see beauty in Christ. And then I have a desire to learn more and to enter into it. But then sanctification, positional sanctification, is not only sanctification of the spirit, which is the work of God in me, but it's also once I enter in through the gate, I come to that great brazen altar, the work of Christ. And the second part of Positional sanctification is the work that the Lord Jesus did for me. So I think we have both. There's two parts to positional sanctification, is there not? So the first is the man standing outside of the gate and seeing the beauty and desiring to enter in, the quickening of the spirit, the work in me. And then the second part is when I realize the work for me. And uh, that's at the great brazen altar. And I, I uh, at that point, a Christian is sealed. And uh, at that point, we have all of our privileges. But the question is, do I enter into the enjoyment of it and the real blessing of it? And that's that. And the personal sanctification is the next step, isn't it? The brazen altar. It Absolutely. doesn't hurt to review this. Uh, 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 labor, you mean? Brazen labor. Raise and labor, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. We I'm won't always... enter into, it's not that our rights are any different, 
the child has the same rights as a father, right? But it's a question of enjoyment and appreciation. That's the therefore in Romans chapter 12, 1, isn't it? Beautiful, isn't it? Hmm. Just say that one more time, please, um, about Romans 12. Well, Romans 12, 1 is, says, therefore, remember the last chapter of, uh, last verses of Romans 11 are the results of uh, God's sovereign sovereignty and creation and blessing but then man's failure and responsibility in chapter 10 but then god's irresistible purposes god's purposes will never be frustrated his irresistible purposes of blessing and uh, and that's really salvation isn't it but then once we are saved now we need to lay hold of the blessings we've been brought into, the high privilege we've been brought into. <clears throat> and that's where the labor comes in and that's where the holy place comes in. I wanna be a spiritually minded Christian. So when I'm saved, I may only be a, uh, if I stop there, I may well be a worldly minded Christian. If I get to the labor and I enjoy some of the mercies of Christianity, the kingdom of God, as it's called, I've got a chart on that. I'll bring that next week, Lord willing. But some of those parallels, there's many others in scripture, but uh, that's where I enter into some of the blessings of Christianity from a practical standpoint. But then our proper portion as Christians is in the heavenly places. And that's... Uh, figured there once we enter into the tent itself that's to be spiritually minded so i may be a worldly minded christian as mr walston says i may be an earthly minded christian we'll see that later on in the uh, journey from egypt to canaan or i preferably am a spiritually minded christian a heavenly minded christian and that's when by consecration and practical sanctification we enter into the tremendous privileges and blessings of the uh, holy place now again the heavenly the heavenly place again the privileges are the same once we're saved but the question is our appreciation of it isn't this where uh, so much of christendom leaves the christian is being occupied with the christian privileges and uh, blessings rather than the blesser and so we get taken up with that and the work and, 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 and working for the Lord when uh, we might, might not even be um, uh, following it according to, the, to the, the rules, shall we say. A man, except a man strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. But I, I just say getting occupied with the privileges of Christianity rather than the one who has granted them to us. The person himself, I believe, leaves us probably no further than than the the labor. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly. I true. was thinking, Eric. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the uh, oh, John? John Camp here. Uh, hi, John. John. Yeah. Um, the I suppose you're going to develop this. Uh, further in your talks, but the two altars are significant. The brazen altar, where we meet God, as it were, uh, uh, in our uh, deep need as sinners, and we have the whole question of sins settled through the sacrifice of Christ and the, the burning of the heifer there and uh, the sacrifice uh, the fire of God's judgment upon the person of Christ, uh, delivering us from our sinful condition and the sins that we have committed. But then there's the altar of uh, incense. Uh, you know, in Psalm 84, it speaks of uh, the altars, plural. Uh, there's a difference.
was in the altar of incense, of course. It's a picture of uh, worship, praise to God. Uh, there's no sacrifice on that altar, although I believe the blood was uh, put on the horns of it. But it speaks of, uh, of worship, uh, the labor coming between those two altars, is very important, as you have been bringing out, that uh, there needs to be that practical uh, washing of water by the Word. If I'm careless uh, uh, about my walk and ways, I'm not, I'm not, although I'm saved, I'm not fitted for uh, entrance into the holy place and worship to the Lord as prefigured in the altar of incense, which is... Uh, uh, the privilege of the believer to uh, offer up that sacrifice of praise. Is is that right, uh, Eric? That's very well put, John. Thank you. Again, the privileges are the same, but it's the appreciation that changes. And that's what the Lord would have for us. Remember the fathers in uh, 1 John 2, it says there, um, Ye have known the Father. So they enter into the very presence of God, the third heaven in a certain sense. Uh, they enter into the appreciation of God himself. What a wonderful privilege that is, as well as all the other blessings. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric, also uh, the third heaven is the, the, holy, the holy place, not the holy of holies. Maybe make that distinction. I know it seems like we're repeating, but uh, people like me are slow to remember. <laughs> well, I think the third heaven is the Holy of Holies. It's the Ark. And it's a certain sense that we enter in, we enter in within the veil, right? In our worship, according to Hebrews 10. The veil has been rent for the Christian. And we enter into the blessings of that place. That's where our worship is, is oh. in the Holy of Holies. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I see. But in Judaism, of course, that way was blocked. So then, um, so there's nothing in the tabernacle that really speaks to um, God's dwelling place, uh, essential dwelling place. That's well, not that's, available to us. Well, it is available to us, well, and someday we'll be in his presence. You know, that, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But we can enter into the blessings of it right now. It's part of our spiritual heritage, is it not? See, we have two inheritances, right, as Christians? We have the, the inheritance that's beneath our feet, as the brethren used to say, and the inheritance that's over our heads. The inheritance beneath our feet is material. The Lord Jesus is the uh, one who has uh, created everything, and he's going to inherit the heavens and the earth, the created heavens and the earth. Uh, he's going to redeem it back in the future day. And we're co-heirs with him on that. But right now we have that, uh, that portion already of heavenly blessing. That's our spiritual inheritance, and that'll go on for all eternity if I understand that properly. Uh, well, Eric, I, I didn't frame my question properly. I'm speaking of, of God dwelling in light unapproachable. He's come out of that light, but we don't really have that pictured in the tabernacle. Well, I think it's in the Holy of Holies, but in a certain sense, we enter into that. What was unknown in the Old Testament is known to believers because the veil is rent. If I understand that properly. How about don't we, don't we see that brought out in the fact that Christ has become our high priest in this respect, in that while the tabernacle stood, only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies. And that was once a year and not without blood. But now that Christ has entered in not to an earthly tabernacle, but a heavenly one, we are there with him to the eye of faith, right? I mean, so we, by faith, 
enter into the holiest of holies, which they could only do through their high priest. Yes, that's one of our Christian blessings, isn't it? Now, I don't question, Doug, maybe this is what you're driving at, but I don't question that we're going to learn far more when we get to heaven. But we have entrance already into God's immediate presence. The veil is rent. I like to uh, position myself uh, in some of these instances and I was supposing I was the high priest there at the time that the veil was rent. I suppose, was he the one that would have observed this? I, who witnessed the veil being rent? Because <laughs> it, uh, it took place the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, when the incense should have been offered up on the golden altar in front of it and the holy of holies was revealed to one who had never seen it the very hour that the lord died now i'd like to position myself there and say wow what happened you know what an amazing thing took place for whoever observed that and i suppose it would have been the high priest would it not but what all of a sudden that veil rents opens up the way into the Holy of Holies. Hadn't seen that before, shall we say. And now we can enter, you and I, we can enter right into the very presence of the Lord. The veil's gone. But it must have been a, an amazing uh, shock, <laughs> as it were, to whoever observed that. Put yourself in that place and just imagine that picture. You know, Bill Ward, used to say they probably tried to sew it back up again. <laughs> that really would be Judaism, wouldn't it? Right, yeah. Yeah. But it had been rent. What veil are we talking about? There was no tabernacle at the time the Lord died. It's there... And when you get into Hebrews, there's no temple. It's all based upon the tabernacle in the wilderness. Would you just comment on that? But the principle is the same, isn't it, Vern? The principle That's of the That's what veil I'm asking, thing. yeah. Is it yeah. just the principle? It's, it, there was, was there really a, ta a, a <clears throat> was there really a uh, curtain that was rent? And where was that curtain? Well, it tells us plainly the veil of the temple was rent, right? Okay. But in Hebrews, it applies it to the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So I take it the principle is the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, we've gone beyond a half an hour, uh, Doug or Tom. Should we uh, maybe abridge this at this point? People have to yeah, move on I, I, today or something. Yeah, I think it's a good good time uh, to start just generally at the half hour mark afterwards yeah um, let's uh, let's just give thanks our god and father the riches that thou has given us we hold in our hands the revelation of not just thy ways or thy heart, but of thy person. In the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank thee for this time together, for the blessing it is to begin a weekend with our Bibles open, Lord Jesus, occupied with thyself. Bless each one as we go about our day. Bless thy people, we ask. In thine alone worthy name, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.